Hi, welcome to the tutorial on how to use the 2024 Wealth Planner. Uh, my name is Jennifer Butterfield, the creator and founder of Trial by Jenna Fire, and I am really excited. I'm going to just jump right into it. Um, so I'll be using the Excel version of the workbook, and I will be taking uh, and I'll be taking us through each and every step as if I am using it. So if you want to go ahead and follow along with your own wealth planner at home, the only differences between the Excel and the Google Sheets version is going to be a couple of color differentiations for tables and charts throughout the workbook. So keep that in mind. I am going to start down here. If you'll notice, there are a bunch of different tabs at the bottom of the workbook, and that's going to be true for Excel as well. And I'm on the Read Me First tab, and I'll just kind of briefly skim through this. As you can see, there are um, instructions that are written with uh, red arrows and text to clarify how to walk through the planner um, in a visual sense. And so um, each arrow is demonstrating what the text is describing and hopefully pointing out uh, visualizations so that it is clear when you get to that page. Uh, great way to use this for reference. And um, I am going to only briefly scroll through it so that you can kind of get a sense of what each page looks like. However, since I am doing a tutorial currently, I'm going to go get right into it. So I'm on the start with the basics tab here, and I'm going to start with income tax liability and notice there's an asterisk here. Um, before we begin, uh, I highly recommend reading these notes. Uh, this is not professional tax, financial or legal advice. Please talk to a professional for um, these types of matters, uh, especially when in incorporating risk and tax liability and other important financial aspects of your uh, estate. So as far as income tax liability, I'm going to only enter white cells. Um, so as a user, um, I'll notice that there are two different color cells. Um, one will be a color that is either blue or green or purple, depending on what the table is, um, and others are going to be white. And so the white cells are going to be what I'm going to enter as a user because the uh, colored cells will have pre-formulated calculations that will be drawing data from either multiple cells or cells from um, other parts of a worksheet or even different sheets from the workbook. So. Um, some of the uh, sheets are linked to one another and the colored cells I don't need to touch at all. Um, as far as uh, ensuring that it, in the event that there are any mistakes made, um, there is going to be a undo button up here. Um, and I highly recommend saving a copy to either your desktop if you're in Excel or Google Drive if you are on Google Sheets so that um, you have that as kind of like a baseline to come back to in the event that any of the formulas do get broken. So I am a single person. I'm going to file for $180,000 dollars uh, gross annual income. And as you can see, I went ahead and calculated 15% of my gross income going to pre-tax paycheck deduction. So what is that? That is going to be my 401k and my HSA accounts. These are going to be um, tax deferred accounts. So they are directly uh, deducted from my paycheck before uh, federal income tax. Um, here I've got my standardized deduction that is calculated for me and how much my estimated annual tax will be. That is based on my tax bracket, which was automatically calculated when I entered uh, my filing status and my annual gross income. For the state income tax, this varies from state to state, and I am in the state of Texas, so I entered zero because we do not have an income tax uh, in the state of Texas. Um, and then the effective FICA tax rate is 7.65%. 
That's going to leave me with $10,448.33 in take-home pay. And I'm going to go ahead and select my month. And I'm going to make my ideal expense breakdown take-home pay equivalent to what um, the estimated average monthly take-home pay is going to be based on my tax information. Now, an ideal monthly breakdown, you can see this chart has a, a fourth going to housing, transportation is 10%, um, and debt savings and investments is a, a little over a third. Um, these are obviously ideal numbers, and not everybody is going to be able to meet these, um, and it, it may change depending on where you're at. Um, each month is going to have a pie chart to see where you're at with your breakdown. I've got my monthly spending plan here, and in each category, I've got housing, food, medical, pets, transportation, personal care. All of these have drop-down menus as indicated by these little arrows next to them. And I can choose um, what expense in each category I want to budget a monthly goal for. Now, if I have additional expenses for one particular month, such as in November, I have a $500 expense for holiday gifts, um, and that's just for the month of November or December. I'm going to exclude that because there will be a place on my annual review to enter those planned and unplanned one-off monthly expenses. So... When I'm keeping in mind, when I'm filling out my monthly spending plan is this is how much I want to spend on this particular expense each month of the year. It, it will carry over into all of my individual month sheets. So um, the total is going to be down here. And it will also incorporate debt. And so the way I think of debt is I've already spent the money, so now I'm just paying it back. So it's going into my expense budget. Um, I have got uh, no kids, uh, self-employment. I, I am not going to fill any out. So as you can see for this table, I've already filled out my budget and I have got my assets just to the right of it. And I've filled these out as well. I want to kind of go through each and every one just so you kind of see how to use this section of the sheet. So I've got my liquid assets, my tax advantaged assets, and then my taxable assets. So what are those? Um, my liquid are going to be cash and cash equivalents. Um, if you aren't familiar with these terms, um, you can learn a little bit more about them by kind of hovering over um, each of these tabs um, in Excel. And I've got my checking, two different savings accounts, and a money market mutual funds account, um, and then all of these different yields. Um, these cash equivalents um, are going to not be included in um, my current investments when we get into my net worth. So as far as my liquid assets go, I have my four different accounts here, my checking, my two savings accounts, which one of them is a high yield savings account, um, and then my money market mutual funds uh, cash account. So um, I'm the account owner. The reason I have this is mainly because if there's a married couple that's filing um, and, and filling this out together, maybe there is different um, account owners for different, maybe there are uh, different owners for different accounts. And so I wanted to leave room for um, two people and maybe any joint accounts as well. I can give each account a nickname, um, and then I can determine whether or not I'm actively contributing to that account each month. And I can also associate a goal. So here for my savings account with Chase, I can utilize this as a travel and experience 
uh, account and here's what I'm contributing to it each month. That's my goal. Um, as far as my tax advantaged accounts, I can select these from my list. Um, keep in mind that whenever accounting for each and every dollar, any accounts such as a 401k or an HSA um, that are deducted from my paycheck, if I have a traditional job, are going to be already accounted for uh, before calculating my average monthly take home pay. So um, when I'm So my tax advantaged accounts are going to be things like my 401k, my IRA, maybe it's a Roth, maybe it's a traditional, um, and my HSA. Uh, maybe I have kids and I want to do a 529 plan here. Um, and then again, the account owner, nickname, whether I'm actively contributing, the associated goal, and the amount that I would like to plan to set aside each month um, to contribute to those accounts. Um, my individual brokerage account, and I have one with both Fidelity and Charles Schwab here in this example, um, and I want to mark how much I'm investing in each of those each month based on my income. And Matching with my debt, um, I've got credit card debt. I have the opportunity to put my interest rate here, uh, who the creditor is, am I actively repaying it, what the minimum monthly payment is, as well as my monthly goal. Um, that is going to, again, transfer over here to my monthly expenses. Now, I'm going to go into how to go through each month. Um, each month is going to have a pretty similar setup as starting with the basics. So here I'm at January and I'll start by entering my total income. So as you can see, I've got my take home pay, which has carried over from my initial starting with the basics amount. And then I've also made additional income. So I've got my side hustle and I've got my consulting uh, income as well. And I want to be sure that I set aside uh, self-employment taxes for both of these. Um, And I want to be sure that I set aside self-employment taxes. I did 15% of these two streams of income. Um, and so those are going to be over here. Um, as far as my actual uh, expenditures go, I can add these up one by one. And I can match them to my goal as I do. Um, so each day I can come in and I can say, okay, I spent however much on this or however much on that. And that will kind of balance my goal versus how much I'm actually spending. Um, I highly recommend if, if budgeting is a new skill for you to go into this chart every day or at least a couple times a week to enter your expenses and get a, a feel and the muscle memory for how much you're spending and where. Um, it's real easy to get carried away with that in the society. So here I've got my credit card uh, and how much I'm paying off there and my federal student loans. Um, and then I've got my saving and investing. So um, here is how much I've actually contributed as well as these tax advantaged accounts. Um, I've got my employer match for my 401k of 3% and how much I've invested in my 
taxable accounts. And I like to have these auto uh, deducted each month on the same day. So there's literally no thinking about it. Um, now I have to remember with my Roth IRA and other non-employment funded accounts that it, I can, in, I can transfer over the funds, but I have to be sure to invest them. So unless I've automatically uh, chosen a setting for that institution or that account to invest them in a particular fund, um, I have to manually go over there once the money has been transferred into that account and invest it in something if I want it to grow. Um, so yeah, here is the actual savings and investments with the match. And here are my um, actual expenses. And here is my total income for January. As you can see here, I've got a breakdown of my monthly spending this month. And the percentage of my earned income that not only has been saved and invested, but also that has go gone towards debt. Um, in terms of my net worth, so here I have got my net worth. It's important for me to be sure to choose the current month. So if I go to February, as you can see, there's no data entered for February. So my net worth and assets and liabilities are all going to be completely blank um, because there's no data entered there. And it's only looking at this column. So, but I'm in January and um, here I've got my accounts that have transferred over from my starting with the basics page. And I just went through each account and entered the balance um, at the bottom of each uh, asset category, liquid, tax deferred, and taxable. It will uh, add up all of the balances and then down here, it's going to total my assets. Same thing with liabilities. So I've got them categorized by high priority, medium priority, and low priority. Um, it will create a way to look at my net worth below as a total. Um, and then also if I go up here, I'll see that there's a chart. And so I'll be able to track my progress and my net worth um, throughout each month of the year. And also looking at the net worth from a bigger picture throughout the year as a whole. So uh, as you can see, here's a chart of net worth. And so as I make progress and enter each month's account balances, I'll be able to see whether I have a positive trend or a negative trend in terms of my net worth throughout the course of the year. Real estate investments. So I have entered my current month here. I've got a place for your address, city, state, zip, the type. Um, maybe it's a rental property. You can enter those here. Um, and then when you purchased it, who has the deed? Um, and then the annual tax rate. Also, if you have financing for a property, you can enter the term of the loan, the lender name, the principal balance, and the interest rate. I also wanted to include an operating statement because a lot of uh, real estate investment portfolios are run as if they are a business, but they are held within a personal estate. Um, utilizing the um, operating state statement template for each property to track cash flows. Now, this is not tied to any other tables or figures in the workbook. It's really just for um, keeping track of them um, and are not incorporated into um, net worth or the fire figures as well. So here, um, based on my market value, um, I determined this by talking to a licensed realtor, um, what the market value was for each property and also the mortgages that I have outstanding on each property. Um, 
that is how my equity is determined. Um, I subtract the outstanding loan from the market value to obtain the equity. As far as the next sheet, so I'm going to go over here to fire and I'll go ahead and clear the contents here. So um, I'll zoom in a little bit more as well so you can kind of see what we're doing. Um, my current investments are going to be uh, my assets from my net worth. Um, excluding liquid assets, because those are oftentimes uh, utilized for short term expenses or investments. Um, they are not included in my current investments for my retirement uh, projection. Any of these cells that are highlighted in orange are going to be inclusive of the equity it, for my real estate investments. Um, so it's going to use this data from the real estate investment sheet. Um, if you don't have a real estate investment portfolio, you can totally disregard um, those tables that are highlighted in orange. Here I've got my current income and I'm going to go ahead and just say I have an income increase of 4% a year. My average rate of return over the course of a working lifetime is going to be estimated at 9%. Um, there are varying uh, opinions about what the average rate of return is over the course of a working lifetime. So um, from the time somebody starts working until they retire, uh, the S&P 500, which is a low risk index fund, historically has averaged about 11% um, year over year. Um, but we are starting to see uh, contrary numbers. So these are very conservative figures. Um, real estate appreciation, we'll go with 4.5%. And that is just appreciation over the equity that I currently have um, on my portfolio. Um, it's important to keep in mind when I'm factoring in real estate into my retirement projections that I remember that real estate is not liquid, meaning um, unless I leverage the equity or refinance or sell the property, um, it is, it's not like I can go to the bank and take out cash. So, um, you know, I do have cash flows if it is a rental property, but I'm only looking at the appreciation of the equity that I currently own. Um, I felt like that was a, a simplistic way to approach it. Um, and we'll go ahead and put 3% inflation rate. And what is the safe withdrawal rate? This is a great question. So the safe withdrawal rate is going to be the uh, percentage of my investment portfolio that I can withdraw each year and safely do so um, because at that point in my, my life, I have now saved and invested enough money where my money is making enough money for me to withdraw a portion of my portfolio each year for the rest of my life. So I'm going to say a 4% safe withdrawal rate, and you can see it automatically calculated my percentage to my work optional um, year and age. So um So I want to look at some of this data before I zoom out. Um, here, um, I am incorporating just my current investments um, in my taxable and tax deferred accounts. So my Roth IRA, my brokerage account, my 401k, my HSA, all of these are going to be incorporated here. And this is going to be with my real estate equity added. Um, given a 4.5% appreciation. Um, now, I want to zoom out a little bit. 
to determine how I got my calculation. So when this safe withdrawal amount reaches the annual expenses, so those are equal. Um, well, actually, once it falls be beneath 1.0, um, so right here. You can kind of see this is like the tipping point where it starts to cross over. Um, once I once I get to a point where my safe withdrawal amount, um, which is an annual figure, equals my annual expenses, uh, then I will have the calendar year. So as you can see here, um, it is 18 years in 2041. And it also gives me the amount projected that I will need uh, to have saved um, and does so uh, with the real estate equity as well. Um, Now to go to my annual review page, um, I did mention that there were going to be a few white cells that I could add in any planned and unplanned extra expenses each month. So say every single person in my family has a birthday um, in January. Now I do have a gift slot here, but um, I spent a little bit extra. So I can, I can enter those actual expenses here so that I get an accurate idea of the data over the course of the whole year. Here you can see I've got my monthly income. So from month to month, I've got the goal of how much I'd like to be making, as well as the goal for my monthly saving and investing. Um, and then I've got my, my match and my total savings and investments. And this is going to carry over from each month. So when I'm in January, it's going to carry over the data from my income, my uh, actual uh, spend amount, and my debt repayment. Um, it will also carry over a cumulative total. So as I fill out February, um, it will start to increase each month, um, those expenses of the actual column on my annual review. So um, you can kind of match that up and say, okay, well, where am I with my budgeted goal for my dining out expenses? Okay, it's November and I'm at $3,300 and I've got $300 left of my budget to dine out. Um, and then it's got it all totaled up and it also has an average expense per month. Um, based on your actual expenses. It also does this same thing for the debt-free journey. So you've got your goal of how much you want to pay off that year um, and what the average uh, per month is so far based on the actual amount that you have repaid. And um, again, it is cumulative. Here is my annual spend breakdown. So it will go over um, what this looks like based on my 
categorical expenses. So this figure and this figure of my actual expenses. And um, as the year progresses, it will start to change. Um, this table is going to show me my uh, breakdown of what my spending goals versus my actual expenses look like um, for each month. So as you can see here in January, when I remove this, let's see what that does. Uh, I spent a little bit more than planned, but that's cool because everybody in my family has a birthday in January and I repaid a little bit more debt this month. I also have these progress bars of uh, tracking the amount of my earned income in a percent of my uh, savings and investments, as well as my debt. So that is the wealth planner. And I hope that you have a clear idea of how to utilize each sheet and how all of the functions um, interact with one another. Um, and if you ever have any questions regarding the Wealth Planner, please don't hesitate to email me at trialbyagenifier at gmail.com. I'll be sure to post that in the description. Um, and I hope that you have a very, very wealthy 2024. Hi, welcome to the tutorial on how to use